Good evening. Well, welcome to SIAR Virtual, but SIAR nevertheless. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you tonight. Um, be before I introduce our guest speaker, uh, let me tell you a little bit. Tonight is slightly different than what we've been doing lately. Uh, we're going to start with a 20 minute conversation, then our speaker will speak for 20 minutes, and then we're going to switch to the CUNY part for with those students and faculty who signed for it. So let me tell you about Trevor McFedrick, our, our speaker tonight. Uh, it's, it's, it's a true pleasure to have him here. Um, is is one of those individuals which is very difficult to introduce, <laughs> not because uh, not because his accomplishments and not because his uh, phenomenal work, but because he's uh, he's a disruptor. He's a multifaceted. Um, a multifaceted creative mind that doesn't operate in a single territory, which I think is 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 is, is very proper um, to talk about all the things that Trevor touched um, in the current times. And so Trevor just joined us recently to Sire Board, and he has been already a force and, and is is a fantastic uh, person to collaborate and to work with. But let me tell you a little bit about Trevor's background. Uh, as I said, Trevor, I will say the best way to define him is a disruptor. Like many, many talented people these days, he works in multiple mediums and multiple platforms, intersecting the world of culture, social media technology. He has been, and he is, a musician, a DJ, a producer, a director, uh, has been an artist advocate and Spotify. He was um, a key a key person in the development of Spotify in, in America. He also is, together with his partner, has created um, virtual influencers, probably the most known, Little Michaela, which also speak volumes of the state of the culture that we are. So I will say that Trevor, more than anything else, is a cultural agent. He's a cultural producer that doesn't want to be framed in one particular territory and another one because it's all intertwined. And I think this is, uh, as I said, I, I think he's a phenomenal example or where I, I think we're moving forward more and more, which is the notion of creativity closing, crossing platform, crossing, territory, crossing territories and trying to touch multiple dimensions. So um, it is my true pleasure to welcome Trevor um, tonight to Sayak. Uh, Trevor, thank you so much for doing this. It's, thank you. It's, as I said, it's great. It's great to have you here. And, uh, and as, I, as I mentioned, we our plan is to talk the first 15 minutes or so to, to, to have a, a, an informal, relaxed conversation sure. about some of the issues. Uh, and then uh, and then we will jump into your presentation in relation to it. So let, let me start with very unfair and general question, but I think it's in, 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 in everybody's mind these days, in the current time that we are with COVID, uh, social unrest in relation to racism in our country and all over the world. Um, but how do, you see, how do you see the role of intersection between technology, medium, platforms of communications, um, creativity, uh, again, in different territories. As, as I said, it's an incredibly general question, but maybe just for you to start to, yeah. um, to to start to unravel some of these issues. Yeah, no, I mean, first of all, thank you for having me. It's, it's truly the highest honor to, to be a part of this organization and to help wherever I can. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely a broad question, an interesting one. I think, you know, quite personally, I'm really interested in this moment in time because there does seem to be a bit of a reckoning. I'm someone who grew up this techno optimist. Uh, I grew up in the Midwest, you know, pretty poor, but was able to use technology to kind of level the playing field. I could pirate software. I could read whatever I wanted to learn. And I really kind of used that tooling and that opportunity to create more opportunities for myself. Uh, then when you were reading that kind of early Kevin Kelly-ish, you know, techno optimist literature, there was so much talk about, you know, the internet bringing truth to everyone and kind of solving for uh, you know the, the solving for so many of our social ills and it seems to have reinforced them and created more um, and so I think you know as a creative person I'm spending a lot of time personally in this moment of reckoning thinking are there ways to kind of unwind the network effects especially of the platforms that dominate our lives and to potentially explore other solutions 
Some of them, you know, explicitly humanist and kind of like low tech and some of them, you know, high tech stuff like, like, like crypto and building kind of like secondary economies around um, you know, different ways of creating. And so in this moment of, of kind of chaos, I'm really interested in people taking this moment and, and, and building the future. And I think the people that are listening to this conversation and a lot of the students inside are going to be people that do those things. Uh, let's talk a little bit. I mean, as I as I mentioned, um, one way let, let's say your public your public life started mostly as a musician as a DJ. Sure. But I I, I want to know a little bit more if, if moving into other into other mechanisms of creativity was it, it was fueled by a desire that okay music is not enough you need to be music with something else or it was a, kind of a more organic in terms to understand how the evolution of music as a creative force and the relation with, again, with technology, but other platforms, if it was something more natural or was something that you were orchestrating, yeah. because again, a level of, I don't know, unsatisfaction or, or that you wanted to reach. That's one, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so again, I, you know, I think growing up in, in the Midwest, I didn't necessarily uh, believe that like technology or the arts could be a career, uh, but they were very much passions of mine. And, and so, you know, music was kind of this hobby. I was playing in, in punk rock and hardcore bands and, you know, hanging out in, in fields and going to raves and doing things that are kind of like uniquely Iowa. And technology was always this kind of thing where I could create video games. I could kind of like, uh, you know, automate some of the work that I had to do or I could kind of get little side gigs. When I became a professional musician, kind of almost uh, on accident, um, I was um, birthed into a music industry that was crumbling. Um, the internet was eating the music business. And as a result, a lot of the major players were having this incredible brain drain. It was kind of disenchanting to, to walk into a major record label and to be met with people who had less of an understanding about some of the things that you wanted to do than, than yourself. And they're supposed to be the domain experts. And so when I started interfacing with the with like Silicon Valley and technologists and entrepreneurs in that space, it struck me that so much of the innovation and the kind of like the, the, the desire I had to create new ideas to kind of take things from zero to one, so to speak, uh, I had kind of expected those things to be happening in like visual art or in the kind of culture industries, music, wherever else, but they had been kind of bled dry. And I think a lot of that innovation was, um, you know, uh, being pushed to the side. And so instead to kind of enter a space where innovation and taking big risks wasn't only celebrated, you were often rewarded for it, was really intriguing. And I think that was kind of a, a magnetizing force that pulled me further and further into kind of technology and Silicon Valley and some of that kind of like California innovation ideology that, um, you know, we've all heard so much about. Maybe maybe that's a good side ways to talk more specific about how you got involved and, and your role and what why you want to, what were your aspirations and ambition in working with Spotify. Yeah, that's a a, a a difficult one to kind of unpack because there's so many different parts of it. But like um, you know, the long and short, and I'll try to you know, uh, I'll try to be as brief as possible. Is that I have been thinking a lot about building new economies for artists and creative people since. I was kind of pushed into the music industry and you know, abruptly met with how, in my opinion, unfair the architecture and the economics were for the people that were creating a lot of the value for the music uh, industry. And when I was touring, I, um, you know, I was, was playing festivals, I was in this group and we were at South by Southwest. And this is kind of an anecdote, but kind of a funny one. And um, South by Southwest as it does often runs quite late. And uh, we were actually running about four hours behind for a performance. At a, at, a, at, a, at a gig and um, I was just hiding in the back and I was sitting around reading a book. There was another gentleman reading a book and everyone else was kind of like drinking and hanging out and partying. And we kind of referred to each other and started talking about like what a mess this thing was and what a mess the music industry was and how potentially we could be using our brains for other things. And we stayed in touch. And, you know, a few years later I was uh, on tour actually opening for Katy Perry on a global tour. And, um, you know, we'd been on the road for a year, I was pre-fried, you know, you're on the road that long, like the idea of like a, a normal meal or like going to the gym seems pretty romantic and exciting. And um, I got a phone call from that person, D.A. Wallach, mentioning that they were going to be bringing Spotify to North America. And they were kind of looking for someone that could interface between artists, someone who had been an artist, a writer, a producer, and someone that could speak technically with kind of engineers in, in Scandinavia, you know, in Sweden, where a lot of the main team was. And, um, you know, that was kind of a, a broad remit, but the dream was to kind of build out this function that would support artists internally as this new streaming model took over. And, um, you know, that was, that was the kind of really appealing part to me was it was pretty apparent that 
downloads and CDs were broken and that streaming was going to be the future. I'm not sure it was clear to everyone else, but I wanted to say and trying to make that future, you know, as good for artists as it could be. And, um, you know, I think some would argue that it hasn't been as good for artists as it could be, but, um, you know, that's the, that's the constant battle trying to fight the good fight so that creative people can get a win here and there. Um, the, the other, the other one, which I think everybody is fully aware and particularly, um, in recent years the, with the rise of social media, with the rise of new platforms of communication, the way that we consume and distribute knowledge information for good and for bad. Um, but, uh, what, what brought you to start to think about the notion of virtual influences? And again, as I said, Little Miguel is not the only one, but it's probably the most known. Yeah. And so can, can, I, I, I'm very intrigued by that. I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm a little bit from, from different generations. So you know, I was yeah. thinking of gorillas and stuff like that. So these are, these are things that were flirting in, in with, the, with your previous, with the other one, with the music. But I, I, I wonder what... what, what Again, what, what is in your mind? What was in your mind and what was in your mind? Your partner with, with Little Michaela and also yeah. what were the expectations or do you think when were you supposed to go or, or it took a completely different dimension? Yeah, uh, and so it, it's funny, like people definitely describe the project as like a virtual virtual influencer project. And I actually like the etymology of that word and like in that like contextually, like what we're trying to do is very much influence popular culture and really kind of try to influence the, the globe. But what we've always wanted to build is kind of like a modern Marvel or Disney. And the, the kind of really simple you know, way to explain it was if you were going to build Marvel or Disney now and kind of create these narratives and these characters that would influence generations, you probably wouldn't start it in comic books. You probably wouldn't start it in, in cinema or in film. And so if you were going to start it, you know, what would that look like? And is there a way to kind of optimize for a Disney that's kind of like battle tested and ready for a future that you know that I call like a spatial computing future, kind of like a metaverse future, we'll call it like augmented reality future. And so, with those two things in mind, you know, the dream was okay. If um, if we've seen a, a outcomes in the United States like gay marriage that have been immensely influenced by narratives like Will and Grace or the Ellen Show, right? Um, are there ways to kind of mirror that success and maybe scale that success in an era where new types of media? are clearly shaping you know, the rhetoric and the ideology of young people. Um, I mentioned that kind of like Kevin Kelly techno-optimist streak inside of myself, and I forever lived in hacker spaces, whether it's in IRC or in you know, message boards or whatever it was. And those were traditionally, in my experience, like really these optimist, progressive, like, you know, intriguing spaces where people wanted to build a better future and one that looked, uh, uh, um, you know, like a, uh, far more progressive than like I think it currently does in those circles now. Often when you enter those spaces, there's this kind of more regressive ideology, um, one that kind of me that reeks of this kind of, um, you know, this, this apathetic or like at, at best, like, you know, uh, maybe, maybe corrosive at worst. Um, you know, group of mostly young men. And so the dream for me was to say, okay, if clearly there's technology and new forms of media that are being used to shape the ideology of these young people. Could you kind of use that force for good? Could you kind of judo it and turn it around? If all of these timelines, all of these platforms were going to reward car crash narratives, could you actually, you know, kind of in a vacuum, create your own car crashes that were more compelling than a Kardashian or a Trump narrative and then imbue these moral themes inside of them the same way comic books did for me as a young person and kind of like shift the ideology of a generation of people who are like enraptured in these narratives to ones that were more uh, empathetic or tolerant. And that was kind of this big pipe dream, right? And all of that's kind of entangled in this technology because I've always thought of Disney as a technology company. You know, a bunch of Imagineers building tooling that enabled really amazing storytelling. And so that was very much the dream. Um, I think we've like taken some pretty, taken some like pretty amazing steps, but there's still like, you know, a lot to be done. So in a way you will say that there is a highly under, uh, political underline in it, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm someone who- To understand, to, or maybe, maybe a social political one, right? Yeah, I mean, I think there's layers to all of it, right? There's like a cultural critique in it. You know, there obviously is like a, a kind of more explicit, kind of immediate and maybe more like tenable or tangible uh, political discourse that like our characters are having. But there also is kind of an allegorical one that we hope can like, you know, reinforce ideas for generations to come. And, you know, often when I'm onboarding new employees, we'll talk a lot about how we split up our time and the messaging, what we're thinking about. And, you know, we do spend a, a fair amount of time focusing on things that are immediate, you know, getting people out to vote, informing, you know, young people, especially on what policies are important and where they can make their voice heard. 
but also we spend probably even more time working on kind of like these giant allegorical tales that can, you know, reinforce people for, for hundreds of years. And, and when I'm talking to them, people push back. I often say, well, here's a question, you know, like who are some of your favorite politicians from, you know, the 17th century or from hundreds of years ago? And they don't really have any answers. And I ask them, well, you know, who are some of your favorite screen, you know, screenwriters or playwrights or, um, you know, artists from before the 17th century? And they have tons of ideas, right? And that's because, you know, the work of a Macbeth is as relevant now as it was hundreds of years ago. And so, you know, we are narrative driven creatures. And I think like the right narratives can really do uh, uh, quite a lot of good, uh, you know, and especially compounded over a long period of time. You mentioned, and this is this is my, maybe my last question before we, we we move to the part of, of your of your talk. Uh, you you mentioned you mentioned narratives and I mean the way that you always talk about technology, and I know this because we talk many times. You always intersect it with narratives and technology, right? Yes. So, and this is probably the most selfish question, which is, how do you think the narrative technology and, and our world, the world of architecture, can intersect? And, and where is your interest in relation to architecture? Because you have one. Uh, yeah. And I think it can it come from a different angle that anybody who, let's say, is, a, is an architect by, by education. Sure. Uh, how, how do you envision, how do you think we, we, we need to start to think about this? What, what do you think are the... The steps. What what are the mechanisms? Uh, 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 and again, particularly since many of the people who study architecture, they're going to do other things. Yeah. Or the notion of architecture just to be reduced to buildings seems like a a very reductive way. That I think there is a, architecture could be it, it, it's a much more open and complex one. So yeah, I, that's a perfect segue into some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about. Um, uh, and I think when we first started speaking, the thing that I was most drawn to was this idea of being a school of architectural thinking. And I think when we, when we first got on, on, on a video chat, actually, um, you know, I, I spoke to my favorite thinkers being physicists and architects, you know, people who are like really well-versed in systems thinking, people that can, you know, look at a, 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 at a network or look at a, uh, a set of problems or look at an opportunity as a whole, also break it down into these parts that can be solved for, these problems that can be solved for and that can be improved. And so, uh, you know, what I'm really excited about and, and what I'm going to talk about a bit and, and what I'm doing is, you know, having a generation of, of young people that are comfortable navigating uh, the world spatially, especially as computing, you know, begins to introduce more and more uh, uh, space to our to our lives uh, and or more and more spatial thinking into the, the interfaces that we spend more, most of our time in. And so like even, you know, new iPhones having LiDAR sensors, like that's going to like encourage a whole bunch of developers to start thinking spatially. And I, I worry that you're gonna have a bunch of like 2D interface and UX people who are kind of web 2.0 specialized starting to build out this like new digital layer on top of our lives. And so what I'm really interested in is figuring out how I can take a lot of you know young people, especially who are deeply interested in building, you know, or, or exploring and, and nurturing space, into this emergent computing shift, such that we don't have one that feels you know like it was built by a bunch of you know boring twenty-two year old white guys from Silicon Valley or whatever, like we have now. There are opportunities to build a kind of more diverse, inclusive, in my opinion, more exciting computing f future, and that's the stuff that like I'm really really excited about. And you know, obviously, we're doing in our world with game engines. We're spending a lot of time you know in you know in three D in general. But there's going to be all kinds of cool stuff and really all kinds of, I think, um, you know, romantic applications for architect skill sets in this, this, this emergent future. As you said, I think that's the perfect segue to move into your presentation. Uh, thank <laughs> you, Trevor. I I'll see you again in 20 minutes or so on the other side. That's perfect. Yeah. Um, and I, I wish like away. The, the screen is all yours. All right. Wonderful. Yeah. I'll get into a screen share in a second here. Maybe I'll just try to get into it now. And, uh, Dun, dun, dun. Let's see if this guy works. I think we're rocking. Um, all right. Um, you hopefully should be able to see a, a screen that says against specialization, <laughs> full stack careers. Um, I am, I am, as I mentioned, moving, looks, you know, great. looks great. Okay, good. We're rocking. Um, I have someone that has a kind of a, a unique professional background. I'm going to speak to that a little bit. But uh, I'm also someone who was traditionally, I think, crippled by this, you know, lingering thought that I had been preached to over and over again. That specialization was the way to have a fulfilling and rewarding both financially and kind of emotionally career. Um, when I 
was, and I can kind of move into the first slide here and talk about what this, this lecture is. Um, you know, really this lecture is a conversation about like the real world and it's directed at young people. Uh, I've had a few conversations with students at SciArc and I've always been, you know, so incredibly impressed with the level of talent and skill uh, that they're bringing to their work. And in talking to them, they're obviously, there's clearly like a latent fear in applying that to the real world. And so what I'm trying to do is kind of like speak to some of my experiences and some of the things that I found um, to be incompatible with like the life I wanted to live when I was searching for similar resources. Uh, again, the dream is to kind of inform people on how to have a fulfilling and lucrative uh, line of work. And I think um, it'll probably be an exploration of the feelings I had when I was starting my career, because that really is like the the, the, uh, the birthplace of this lecture or this idea. And I think it's gonna be uh, hopefully, you know, insightful and provide some truth on what careers often look like for curious creative people. And uh, my favorite creative people are ones that are deeply curious, that kind of have them these obsessive interests in things and kind of go down these rabbit holes and really lose themselves in them. And so this is, um, this is the press bio. This is the kind of thing that I would read when I was 22 about someone that was speaking to me at like a guest lecture and get really freaked out by it. And this is what my PR team would go out with. They'd be like, there's this guy, Trevor McFedries. He's 34. He's from Iowa, but LA is home. You probably know him because of his company, Brud, and this thing, Little Michaela. Um, you know, most recently, the company raised $20 million at $145 million valuation from Sequoia and Spark, two of the most well-known investors in Silicon Valley. And this is actually a stat that blew my mind the first time I heard it. But I'm one of 14 black founders to ever raise more than $25 million. Um, as for now, I mentioned an early Spotify employee. And when I was a musician, I put out a top 10 album. I played festivals like Coachella and Lollapalooza. Um, you know, I was a producer for a bunch of pop acts. And I would define myself as an engineer, an artist, an entrepreneur, and most proud of, of my SciArc board membership. Like I would read that as a 22 year old and just be fucking terrified, right? Like how am I supposed to like build a career like that, compete with people like that, do things like that? And the reality is nobody talks about all of the hard stuff, all of the ups and downs, and especially the downs. And in my opinion, a career or really anything that you're doing or anything you're building or creating often looks more like this chart than one that's a linear kind of up and to the right chart. And this is kind of simple. On the left side, there's this, uh, this is the best idea ever. And for me as like a, you know, a 22 year old young person, it was like, man, I am ready to get out into the world. I am ready to create, I'm ready to leave my mark on the universe. And then, you know, you get out and do it and things are hard, but you, you still kind of think, okay, this is fun. Well, well, this is way harder than I thought. This is gonna be a lot of work. And then all of a sudden you're like, this sucks. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm lost in the sea of nothingness. And you know, there's this dark swamp of despair here. Um, above that, they have this, this, this belief, persistence, and family and humor that are this bridge that get you out of those things. And I think that's, that's accurate. Um, I think it, it, for myself, however, that bridge between like the really low places where I'm, I'm not getting anything right and where I start to figure things out uh, is, is absolutely, for me, friends. And I think this this framework that I'm going to explore a little bit with you guys, where you're able to like really lean into yourself and to figure out how you're differentiated and what makes you special. And also, I think, you know, figure out some of the things that you're embarrassed of and some of the things you're probably scared to show with the world and why I think it's important to lean into those things. So on this next slide, uh, I talk about like this idea of a full stack career. And I actually put like a Gary Vaynerchuk hustle is the most important word because like, it sounds like some Silicon Valley kind of like tech bro, uh, you know, term. And it really is actually like an iterative version of a full stack employee or a full stack engineer. And for those of you that aren't aware of kind of startup culture, a full stack engineer is someone that's capable of engineering across like the entire stack of, of a software application or whatever you're building, back end, front end, whatever it is. And so those people are extremely valuable, right? Because they can bring something uh, to fruition by themselves. Um, they, can, they can kind of do it all. Uh, and thinking about a full stack career or what a full stack employee is, I went to look for the person that originally coined it. And there was someone that described it in kind of real Silicon Valley style parlance as someone uh, whilst not necessarily having deep vertical expertise in more than one domain, such full stack employees have an intuitive understanding of the value of design and user experience, engineering and algorithms, but also narrative and storytelling and can work with simple prototypes to develop learning. For me, that's obviously a bit long winded and like the dream of this presentation isn't to make you like a Silicon Valley super soldier that they're describing there. 
Uh, for me, really what I'm trying to talk about or what I'm trying to describe or present to you is a career that defies specialized norms and rather lives across different fields, right? Um, I've talked to people in here who are deeply interested in video games, they're interested in sports, they're interested in fashion, they're interested in you know engineering. And all of those things can feel uh, complicated to mesh into a career, but I absolutely think that there's a way to do so. And you know, for me, the kind of like a, a, a most macro way of viewing what a full stack career look can look like in my own interpretation is I found myself, uh, uh, you know, eventually becoming someone who can dream up something who can then build the kind of like a very first or like most basic version of that thing. And then I'm capable of selling that thing. And I think for a lot of you, that actually is a decent framework to think about, like, you know, where you're strong, where you're weak, if you're interested in any of, or all of those things. And I think the sell it part is the part that most people, when I talk to are like, I don't want to sell anything. And it's like, well, you know, I, I, you probably had to sell yourself to get into this university. You probably had to sell yourself to meet your friends or meet your partner. I think when you believe in what you're doing or what you're building, it can be quite easy. And so there's probably opportunities to build that skill set in a way that is, does inspire curiosity, does inspire obsession. And the last little point I want to make here is that some people love to specialize. And this shouldn't be off-putting for those people. I think there absolutely is, you know, are spaces, especially in kind of a talent marketplace or in the jobs marketplace for people who want to sit and write code all day long. They want to think about new programming languages and JavaScript frameworks all day, every day. God bless you. I love you. I spent a lot of time wishing I was that person. But the reality is that in my experience, I've had people and in industry preach to me that space specialization was the end all be all that you don't want to be a jack of all trades and master of none. You want to be someone who's hyper specialized. And I put this little graphic over here that I saw when I was just digging around for silly little images. And it's clear to me that when young people are obsessed with things, it's treated as a sign of high intelligence, right? You're obsessed with dinosaurs or trucks, or you can't get enough of history. Man, parents laud their kids, teachers laud those kids and say, man, that's great. I'm glad you're so curious. I'm glad you're so obsessed with this thing. Please go down this rabbit hole as, as, as much as you'd like. And then you get older, and people start kind of pushing you out of that mindset. They say, yeah, well, look, it's cute that you like maybe a pro basketball player, but that's, that's not going to happen. Why don't you slow down? Right? Why don't you get interested in something that's more reasonable? And you see that, you know, all across the board. It could be, you know, fine art, it could be visual art, photography, whatever it is. And I actually think there's an opportunity to like reframe that conversation and to think about how even, you know, if you're talking from a purely financial outcome, how the market provides outside rewards to unique points of view. And what does that mean in practice? It means like, you know, um, read from Netflix when he decided he wanted to blow up his DVD mailing business and create a streaming platform, right? Like the markets and an industry were rewarded that unique point of view that the blockbuster was going to go away, that DVDs were going to go away, the internet was going to be the way that we enter, you know, entertained ourselves going forward. Um, you know, that kind of thinking and, and those kind of point of views, in my experience, have come from people that have a lot of really unique experience. And oftentimes that can be, you know, through travel because they're passionate about travel. It can be from Magic the Gathering because they're passionate about Magic the Gathering. It can be from lots of different scenarios that you know, reinforce ideas or strategies or ways of approaching our lives. And those unique experiences then of course inform those unique point of views that are then rewarded in, in, you know, really handsomely in the marketplace. Um, you know, and beyond that, we, we've begun to see like a professional landscape where we have a best idea wins culture. Uh, that, that California ideology, the kind of Google OKR, you know, you should be able to challenge your higher ups <clears throat> and the janitor should be able to bring us the best idea that gets us to the next, the next, uh, the next fundraise, whatever it is. That culture is, is permeating really all of modern industry. And I think if you are someone who's able to go out into the world to reference, you know, important curiosities or obsessions that you have and take those frameworks, those understandings and apply them to the industry that you're in, you're going to have really good outcomes. Um, the other point I wanted to talk about here is that specialization in an age of automation is uh, a really curious one to consider. Uh, those of you who are interested in like machine learning or artificial intelligence or any of these kind of like modern uh, uh, modes of automation uh, are, are probably well aware that hyper specialized things, things that are easily repeatable are going to be the first things to be automated away. 
right? And so if you're a, a high powered lawyer who's just digging through you know, legal language and, and figuring out ways to kind of like craft arguments, that's something to me that probably has a scope that's narrow enough, but it's actually probably pretty automatable. Um, you know, that you know, machine learning engineers often joke that like, you know, the janitor is probably the last person to be automated because candidly, people walk into bathrooms and they pee all over the wall, right? There's this, this random set of outcomes that actually are pretty hard to automate. And so if you think about hyper specialization, there is a chance that you are more apt to be automated out of a role. Whereas if you are able to lean into more, you know, liberal artsy interests or things where you can apply big ideas to the new tools and technology that can bring those ideas to fruition, you probably have a, 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 you probably have a better chance, in my opinion, of uh, being in a leadership role or having an outcome that could be fulfilling spiritually and financially. One way that I've talked with um, young people about how to discover or how to lean into um, the ways they're differentiated and their kind of unique points of view is to think about things they're embarrassed about. Um, you know, again, the market rewards a unique point of view. And oftentimes we find ourselves in industries or with peers that start to look pretty homogenous, right? And there are things that are inside the bounds of conversation and there are things that are outside the bounds of conversation or oftentimes look down upon. Um, and, and, and in my experience, that has been really rewarding for me personally. And I think as a framework for understanding how you can be differentiated is really helpful. And you know what it usually looks like for me is to say, okay, hey, I, I know that you are in a, use music as an example, because we're gonna do it again. You are in a punk rock band, but you love opera, you know, like, what if you were to apply operatic vocals to what you were doing here? Or, hey, I know that you are you know, deeply interested in machine learning, but you're also interested in you know, gardening. Uh, you know, are there ways to apply you know, models and computer vision such that like, you can sell software to people who care a lot if their grass is green or what's going on? Like, those kind of things, those kind of like, obtuse ways of thinking are actually really helpful. And um, you know, being mindful of time here, what do we got? All right, cool. One good example of that is, and kind of keeping the music analogy, I, I mean, I imagine if someone came to you and they said, hey, look, like, you know, I'm like a, a modern day Nancy Sinatra, but my vibe is like I'm a Nancy Sinatra that grew up in a trailer park. And you know what, I, what I'm gonna be doing is I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna sing ballads, you know, kind of operatic ballads, but over rap beats that also have like full string sections. Like that would sound totally nuts. You'd be like, wait a minute, there's like no place in popular music for like a Nancy Sinatra, these boots are made for walk-in, but with like a kid rock vibe, singing ballads over rap beats with like, you know, orchestral sections. That it, where does that fit in the world? And of course, like what we're talking about is Lana Del Rey, right? And so this is a good example, in my opinion, of someone saying like, here are these, you know, unique interest, this high glam kind of old Hollywood Nancy Sinatra thing. But I'm also really interested in like trailer parks and hip hop. Those things feel, you know, diametrically opposed to each other, but actually are like a really interesting way of differentiating yourself in a marketplace. And in the talent marketplace, what you'll often find is there are people that are just like you. And they're looking for a champion or a voice that can articulate what they're looking to see in the world. And you can bring that to fruition. Um, now, I think this last slide here, I think I'm good on time, is a picture of me at 22 years old. And it's the last slide because I think it's important to remember that like everybody started at a place where they were terrified and confused and looking to make sense of, you know, a world that can feel like it's shifting below their feet. Um, you know, this is me in, in 2007, as written here, and I was living at home, college dropout. Uh, it was the end of, you know, the Bush era. I felt pretty disenchanted with politics. I felt pretty disenchanted with the world. Um, you know, I thought I might have been drafted to go fight in Iraq or Afghanistan just a few years ago. Um, you know, I basically had grown up in Iowa where I, I never thought that I could be an artist or a musician uh, or do anything creative. The options for me were kind of PE teacher or, or football coach in my head. And I moved to California where people were doing those things and ended up taking a football scholarship out of high school because it was the one path I had because I was candidly like dirt poor to get a free education. And went up there, hated it, quit, came back to LA and really had these dreams of becoming this artist or creative person. And along my journey from then to now, 
I recognized that the things that I was terribly embarrassed about as a 22 year old actually really informed and it really helped define who I was in different parts of my career. And, you know, when I was 22 and, and really embarrassed about being into emo and street art, like moving to LA and having these tastes that felt <clears throat> quite frankly, quite Iowa, you know, actually really helped me. And that when I started making music, I was able to, you know, lean into these communities that were emerging around artists like Shepard Fairey or Banksy or whatever it was to find people that were also interested in the things that I was into. But beyond that, my, uh, my, my, my interest in emo and kind of guitar music were what differentiated the hip hop beats that I was making and what allowed the group that I was in to kind of carve out space and ended up, you know, you know putting out a, a top 10 album and a couple of top 40 songs. Um, at the same time, <clears throat> I was, you know, really interested in music and, you know, all the people I saw who were doing cool stuff, they were like, I don't like living, sleeping, breathing, being in the studio, writing songs, going on tour. And at the time I was really interested in like writing code and figuring out how to like build software. And I always felt the sense of like guilt, and shame about that. And, you know, when we ended up getting signed to Interscope Records, the reason I was able to get in the room with the executives at that label is because the internet was eating the music industry and they needed someone that knew how to talk about engineering or software, what the future might look like. And the same became true when I, when I joined Spotify, of course. And then I was acutely aware of my uncultured, poor country taste in life. And, you know, as I've gone about my life, I've kind of leaned into that, my career. And I've said, you know, actually, like my, my dream isn't necessarily to be the most avant-garde, like forward thinking artist that defines, you know, the palette of the, the, the coastal elite, but rather to be this kind of tissue or this teacher. Uh, I've often joked, like, I want to see myself as like the two Michelin star corn dog, right? Where you can connect people from the state fair to like, a, you know, another Michelin star restaurant or to kind of like fine dining. And so as I've leaned into that, that taste and that aesthetic, I've actually been able to have some success. You know, I think that like Rudd and Michaela are a good example of me explicitly saying like, look, the dream here is to take ideas, um, you know, postmodern ideas about identity, reality, things that feel, you know, very kind of like uh, lit crit or whatever it is and condense them into a, a version or, or, or kind of like a pervert them, attract them into a version of a thing of those ideas that are accessible to young people. And so oftentimes in our Instagram comments, we'll have young people talking about, you know, is she real? Talk about Michaela and we'll have another kid say she's realer than Kylie Jenner. And you watch these kids unpack ideas about identity and reality that are traditionally presented in like really dense texts. And then of course, beyond that, at that time I was broke and I knew I was broke and I knew I would need to support my family and my mother and sister at some point in the near future. And so I was reading a ton about, you know, business and finance. And, you know, those, those are almost dirty words in, in the arts. And at the time, I kind of had to make it a secret. But in, in my, you know, my interest in those things have paid dividends and that I've been able and prepared to kind of have conversations with managers or label heads or people that are supplying the capital for you to explore whatever you're doing, whether that's a manager in a big organization who's going to approve a budget or it's a venture capitalist or it's a, you know, a record label head. There are people that are going to be providing you the resources that you need to see your creative visions through. And I think me being interested in those things allowed me to do those things. So all I have to say, lean into the things that make you embarrassingly you. They're going to provide uh, far more than kind of following the homogenous pack down whatever road has been already beaten down by a generation of creative people before you. And with that, I think I'm a minute over. My apologies, but I will stop my screen share and get back to chatting. Uh, Trevor, thank you for that fantastic high speed presentation. <laughs> um, th th thank you so much. This was, uh, we, I think we're going to have to add motivational speaker to, to your long resume. <laughs> um, so th this is the part I think uh, we, we, we thank you everybody watching in the live stream. Um, and then we're going to move to the Q&A part for those who signed to join us there. So for those of you watching, thank you so much. Trevor, a pleasure. Thank you so much. And to be continuing the Q&A.